Agile FM Radio for the Agile Community. www.agile.fm Yeah, welcome listeners to another episode of Agile FM and today I have a guest I was really looking forward to having on this podcast for a long, long time, Yves Anul from Belgium, from um, Ghent to be specific. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Eve. Thank you and thank you for having me, Jochen. Well, you are a Agile coach, I'm an Agile coach, does that make us pair coaches? Is that what pair coaching is? Because that's what your website is and that's what you're focusing on in your career. Uh, yes, well, um, it, it's, it's a very good question because I like to, when I uh, work, for example, trainings and workshops, I like to, um, to do it with two people because my idea is that when you're with two, the chances are uh, much bigger that, that the quality is higher. Uh, so if we would do a workshop together, we would, we would do pair coaching. Um, and, and I've done that with multiple people all around the world, even people that I've never met before, that we did maybe something like this, a, a five to ten minute talk on Skype, maybe a little bit longer, to get to know each other, to know a little bit about what we're doing and how we're going to do it, and then do a workshop together. Um, and one of the reasons why I like to do that is that I've seen multiple presentations from very, very good speakers, very good presenters that completely screwed it up for whatever reason. It could be that they had a hangover, it could be that they just had a bad day, that they, I don't know, that they had a bad night of sleep, whatever, and, and that they just don't do it well. And if you're with two, the chance that both of you have a bad day on the same day is already a lot lower, just statistically. Uh, but also you encourage each other uh, a lot by, by adding comments. The big risks with, with people who've never worked together is that you keep wanting to add something. So I say something and then you want to add something smart to it and that we, we keep going over time. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that is a bigger risk. Um, but one of the, the advantages is if I say something, so for example, I get a question from the audience and I say, how would you do this? If I say, well, it depends and you could do it this way or you could that, do it that way, they will still pick one of my two IDs. If I say something and you say something completely different, they might think, oh, maybe there is a third way and they might come up with their third better ID, which works better for them. And so that's one of the multiple ways how, how pairing with multiple people can, can help the audience. That's an, that's an awesome idea. And um, I mean, you've been in this uh, business for a long, long time and everybody familiar with Agile Concepts, I think, came at one point in their career across the topic of pair programming. Um, so pair coaching, um, what you're saying is a, is a technique not only to uh, explore more options, more alternatives, but also, isn't it also learning between the coaches? Oh yes, definitely. Uh, for me, one of the things I've, I've noticed, there's multiple ways how people learn, but one of the ways I learn most is by doing. And it could be by doing it in, in a team or with a team, but also by doing a workshop uh, on a certain topic. And of course, you learn a lot when, when you do it on your own, because then you completely have to do it on your own. But if you have someone else next to you who challenges you and who would take and, and give you other ideas, it gives much more, more interaction. So you will definitely learn, learn a lot. Uh, and actually, the, the, the learning helps also to, to sell it, because I sometimes have clients who say, yeah, but two coaches, that, that's very expensive. Well, what I usually do then is say, okay, but you probably have someone internally that you want to, to learn this thing, and uh, I can work together, I can pair, pair up with this person, and I will learn about your company much quicker, because I need to learn about the company culture and, and all other things, and about specifics about the company, and that person can learn from me from Agile. And in that sense, even there, where you have an expert and, and someone who's expert in a different level of different things, we both learn. Uh, so that works at that level as well. That's a that's a great that's a great point. Um, and um, 
from a learning perspective, but also from you know uh, reminding each other, like um, you know from a from a guilt perspective, what what you're working on. Sometimes there is the um, the danger of a coach to drift too much into the daily activities and stay out there because you have somebody who reminds you, hey, let's stay on the coaching level. Yes, exactly. And for me, for example, if I if I think about how Scrum was des designed, where you have a Scrum master and a product owner, for me, they're also kind of pair coaching because they have both different roles, but they still they encourage each other. They they discuss or they they yeah they, they fight. This is maybe too strong as a word, but mm. they 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 interact with each other. And for me, it's looking for. Uh, they both want the same thing. They want a good result, but they focus on, on different aspects. A little bit like um, I could compare it with, with parents, because you have a so-called uh, metaphorical mother role and a father role who are different. And I'm not talking about mothers and fathers. I'm specifically talking about mother role and father role. So it could be that a man takes on a mother role, but the mother role is typically caring about the child, and the father role is, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, is putting the ch pushing uh, pushing the child outside the door. So basically, making sure that he feels or she feels that she can stand on her own. And 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 pair coaching does that in 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 a different way as well. Um, when you have two people, like you say, we both focus on, on two different things mm. while still, when, still caring about the same thing. Yeah, and it just reminds me in, in, in the work I'm doing, I wish I had a peer coach with me in some of my retrospectives. Somebody who can not only spark a new <laughs> idea or interest, but just to help me out while I'm facilitating and vice versa. So um, are you taking that concept also into retrospectives? Uh, I've, I think we've done it already in, in the past, sometimes with two coaches, but sometimes it, it can also be, uh, this is something um, I got from uh, Maggie Mersch, uh, I'm not sure if I pronounce her last name correctly, but uh, she was at PSL, Problem Solving Leadership course with me, uh, and, and there she, she invented something like an active observer. Uh, so that she was in one of the exercises, she was an observer, but she immediately, when she noticed things, she might announce them. Instead of just observing and then after the fact uh, stating something, so you learn something, she said some things right in the middle while things were happening. And sometimes that is needed for people to, to do that because... Uh, when you have a bad habit and when you do something wrong, if people tell you three days after, you might say, yeah, but it's too late to learn something because you can't address it. And when, when there is an active co active observer, uh, so that, that is something I've, I've used a lot since then in, uh, in retrospective, for example. And you don't need a coach. Well, you don't need a professional coach. It could be just anyone. It could be anyone from the team that you just appoint to that role and say, what do you want to to take on this and it usually helps a lot if you give people inside a team such a role because they the hard part for them is that they cannot go into the content anymore but but they have to focus on on, on the, the the meta level i would say but that helps them a lot uh, well depends on, on if they're they're able to do that but a lot of people i've seen pick things up at, at a higher level and they start to understand their own team dynamics a little better if they if they do that Wow. Awesome. And um, that, that's, a, that's a very good idea. And uh, I, I want to come back to peercoaching.net in, um, mm -hmm. in a little bit, uh, a little bit later. But before we do that, I want to uh, tell all the listeners of this podcast that in preparation for this podcast, you actually had to slow down a little bit. Uh, you had to slow down on your walking desk because when we talked earlier, uh, it was quite noisy. You were walking while talking and then you slowed mm -hmm. down for this podcast because of the noise level. But there's uh, something to it you're very passionate about and that's that walking desk. Uh, whoever hasn't seen a walking desk, uh, maybe you just want to uh, give like um, uh, some of your insights how that contributes and why that influences you so much. Yes, so... Um I've, I think for a few years, I think three or four years, I, I read about uh, a walking desk and, and how that influences us. And what I've, what I've learned is that uh, the, the, the catchphrase is that sitting today is, is the new smoking. So basically, most people sit around eight to ten hours a day. And, 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 and then we, we say, 
oh, we, but we go to gym for one or two hours a week and we think it, we're, we're fine and we're moving. But our bodies are actually not made for that. Our bodies are made for moving because it's only the last, I think, 40 to 50 years that we're sitting so much and that we have a sitting job. Uh, and if, if people go to two hours of gym a week, that would be like uh, someone who smokes full time then say, well, but it's, it's fine because I'm, I'm not smoking for two hours a week. We would think this is rubbish. But we say the same thing about gym these days. Um, and so when I read more and more about that, I said, okay, when I, when I design my new office, I really want to have a, a walking desk. Uh, and then I realized, hey, but we're so we're in the the, the process of building a new house. Uh, instead of just uh, preparing everything for a walking desk, why don't I just immediately buy it? Because otherwise, I would be preparing for something and spending a lot of money on a new office that I have never even done. So the moment I realized that, I immediately I, I, I came home that night and I told my wife, this weekend I'm going to buy it. And uh, so I bought a normal um, desk that, that goes up and down uh, in, in an electronic way. So I can just push a button and it goes up and down. And, and then I put a normal treadmill below it. Uh, because in Belgium, we could not find uh, official walking desks. There are a, a few of them available in, in, the, in the States, but at that time, none of them in, in Belgium. And right now, I'm actually really happy that I did that because the official walking desk, they have some preset speeds. And usually for me, that's too slow because mm -hmm. the, the preset speed that they advise for walking desk is 1.6 kilometers, which is, I think, about a mile or something like that, um, uh, an hour. And I'm, I'm already at two kilometers an hour at this moment. And the, the, the speed I was before was four kilometers an hour, which is very, very fast for, for a lot of people. But I, I have my walking desk since December 2012. And yeah, it, it, it's really, really, really helpful. Again, I'm still doing a lot of client work. So in the day, I, I, I don't use it that much. But ever since I have it, I've noticed that I, I walk around much more. I move around much more. For example, I, I usually go by train to my client. Well, on the train station, I, I no longer sit still and stand still and be very annoyed that my train is late, but I just walk in, in large circles waiting for my train. And so I'm actually, if my train is late, um, it, it always makes me feel a little better in the sense that, oh, now I have more time to move a little more, uh, <laughs> awesome. which is which, which well, changes everything. Uh, before I would go as late as possible to my train because I don't like to, to wait for the train. And I was like, oh, but if I go five hour, five minutes earlier, I will okay. still move a little more. So there's less stress at, at, at every level. So how do we need to picture like future sprint planning, like a spinning class where everybody just like <laughs> feel fast uh, forwarding? Yeah. I, I don't know. I have been thinking a lot about that as well. How do you do that as teams? I think if you're not in, in remote teams, I think it's pretty hard. Mm -hmm. But I do, do uh, what I did, uh, and I think I even started that before I, I had uh, my walking desk. But uh, at a previous client, uh, I did a lot of coaching conversations of walking. So there, was, uh, there were actually a few people that when we did one-on-one -on -one coaching that we went out because there was a very specific building. It was a building that uh, at the inside you had a large room. So there's a lot of stairs and a lot of room to, to walk. So we basically walked around the middle of the, um, of the office uh, because we, could, we were at, I think, at the, the, the first floor and we could just walk around and, and see and it was a very nice environment. So every time there was someone said, okay, can we have a, a coaching conversation? We just went outside and we walked. And it really helps if you walk while coaching because you both look in the same direction and that changes it completely. It's really, you're looking both into the future, into the thing where you're talking at. And we already know that from body language, if you're sitting across someone, it might, might feel much more against each other. Mm. And, and so they advise it together in the, in the same direction. Well, it's, it works even better for me if you're walking in the same right. direction. Well, you're also getting more oxygen, right? And you're, you're, exactly. you're out, you're walking. And yeah, you're absolutely right. It's like there are some certain strolls. I mean, we're coming back to the, the speed here, like certain strolls, and you're just uh, very active. Um, it's an awesome idea, and maybe down the road, and we call the stand-up the the 
the walk-in meeting, the 15 minute. <laughs> uh, I, I do know like that, that. I do know. I'm not sure where I read that, but I, I read about someone who had uh, on top of the. I think it's actually in New York. Uh, uh, on top of his building, so a uh, high tower, there was actually a, a, a possibility to have a run, a running course or something like that. And they had with with uh, Exco, uh, I think they had meetings while walking or while running there. So, so I heard about that, but I'm not sure what company that was. I forgot that. So, sounds like a very luxurious environment. In, uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was definitely that kind of company that had way too much money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but at least they they decided let's let's not have meetings with the table in the middle and and expensive oh. uh, wood uh, table whatever. But they said okay, let's do it outside and then we'll yeah. So we'll yeah. we'll have different kind of discussions and apparently it works for them. And maybe that's why that's so successful, right? So um, here's yeah. a here's another topic: is uh, agile at home. Another one you're very passionate about. What do you mean yes. by agile at home with the family? Uh, yes, that's exactly what I mean. Uh, at, at, for, at the example I can give is, for example, uh, right now, uh, my my well, I need to think. My ten year old son is uh, is he's he doesn't like to read much and he has trouble reading for for multiple uh things multiple reasons uh but one of the things that so he has to do what is it uh, a, a report about a book that he's reading so i've created uh, a burndown chart and actually a cumulative flow diagram on on the pages that he's read so he uh so at one point he said i i have time till the 20th of 28th of January to read it. So he calculated the number of pages, 103 pages, divided by the number of days that he could read, and he came up with a schedule that that he thinks was was possible to do it. And so I created a burndown chart that he could see. Okay, this is the ideal pace to to read. A little more. It's it's not completely uh, in. in uh, uh, linear in the sense that on Friday and Saturday night he's reading more than on other days because he has more time. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a little strange line, but still it, it gives him a, an idea of is he going good or not. And then we created actually a cumulative flow diagram where it's not just a reading, but every time he's reading something he's also writing it down a little bit. Uh, and because he has a very bad handwriting, I'm actually typing it out for him. Um, so we have, I've read so many pages, I've written down so many pages, you have written down so many pages, and so we can see that and how, how, how he's doing. And after one week, he comes back to me and says, well, uh, I misunderstood my teacher, and instead of the 28th of January, we actually have one week less. Uh, so I could just adjust it, and he could see himself, oh, I need to read this much and that much. And where before he doesn't like reading, now he's he's really he knows why he's reading. He sees it every time he has finished something. He comes up to me and says, "Oh, Daddy, would you update the charts because we just do it in in Google Docs?" And he can he can see it. So it's helping him. It's it's visualizing it. Mm -hmm. Something similar that we did years ago. We we don't use it that often at, at home anymore, but we have. Uh, hourglasses, so 15-minute hourglasses that I use a lot for, for stand-ups, uh, but we also use them at home for uh, getting dressed, so they had 15 minutes to get dressed, and of course when my daughter, for example, was one year old, I, I don't have to tell her, you have 15 minutes to get dressed, no, I have to help a little bit, And mm -hmm. but the, 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 the boys were a little older, so there I could just say, this is the order in which you have to do it, and you have 15 minutes. And then the, the, the oldest one, I just say, you have 15 minutes, and you, you do whatever you do. But in 15 minutes, I'm going down, and you have to go downstairs. And if you're ready, well, you join. If you're not ready, well, you stay up alone, and then it's, not, it's less nice for you. Uh, but they had the visual, because I could say 15 minutes, but they didn't understand at the age of one or five, they just didn't understand. But having an hourglass that, that you can visually see helps again. So it's, it's very fast feedback on how they're doing. Well, Eve, it's, it's definitely an, a reminder for everybody who is doing Agile on a day-to-day -day, um, uh, in, in companies, uh, building IT or any kind of projects using the Agile processes that even if you come home, you can continue with it. <laughs> you can yes. do something with your family, vacation planning or whatever it is, you know, or 
Um, and, and it it helps to explain some of the things that that we're doing at work because uh, I I use a lot of agile games and it's very difficult for my kids to understand because they say what XP game you're playing with balloons or uh, the leadership game you're playing with Lego is that work and mm -hmm. if you can then bring some other things back they they might understand a little more uh, so yeah that's that is something that is uh, that is good uh, there's actually a lot more people doing it Henrik Nieberg has some very interesting blog post on how he's doing uh, and ag uh, using agile and Kanban to do uh, a barbecue with 50 people or how he's uh, limiting uh, the number of uh, things they do for doing the dishes and, and improving his the, the everything the course at home it, it makes it much, so much nicer I actually wow. don't think I'm, I'm that far away at, at, at far ahead of, of people doing agile at home I think much more people are, are much better at it but it's it's interesting to bring it back mm -hmm. because why would typically what, what I say when I work with other companies is that if you use your brain at home to do all these things, why don't you do it uh, in, inside in the company? And I think agile coaches should be reminded that, yeah, we do smart things at work. We should do the same things at home to help people as well. Right. And often we don't, right? So it's like, oh, my God, I just did eight hours of that. And, um, but um, yeah. it, it, are these, these are the same, the same principles, right? So talking, talking about these principles, I'm just curious. You've been, as I said earlier, you've been doing this for a while. And uh, when the manifesto in 2001 was created, um, it obviously generated a massive hype in the industry. Um, and a lot of things, processes, things were concerned about how to do it and helping with the implementation. But you generated a topic uh, called Agile Mindset. What was, what was the driving force behind that? Uh, so I like that. I, I was really inspired by by David Hussman when when he uh, invented or published his his dude law, dude's law, where he says uh, the value is 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 why over how, which he compares to to Ohm's law, where he says that if 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 your why is zero, it doesn't matter how much effort you put in your how, because you will you, you will never create much. And it's not that the how is unimportant, but it's that. You should focus on the why and for me it also means focus first on why and make sure that people understand um, I, I also think that we should focus on who because it also matters who's in the team um, but that is something that I, I see more and more companies doing but the why seems a lot of people seems to forget that uh, we, we have and and even in our industry uh, what I've noticed a few years back is that we have so many books on how to do this and this methodology that and this that, but really, and all these books talk a little bit about why, but we didn't have like two, three years back, we didn't have any book about about the mindset, which, mm -hmm. which I find very interesting. Of course, we do have the manifesto, which cr talks about that mindset, um, but it, for a lot of people, it's not enough. Uh, I know that now the Pop and Deeks have have a book about the Agile Mindset, which unfortunately I haven't read because I'm I'm still reading for other books. Um, but yes, for, for me, it's, it's really important to have people think about that because the Agile Mindset is... Um, the, the mindset to, to, uh, to, to be Agile and, and not to do Agile is, is really sometimes confusing. Because we, at the same time, want to talk about, yes, we can, we, we, we want to do it, but yes, we can doesn't mean that we shouldn't think about the long term. Uh, it still means that we, so we have to balance a lot of these things. Um, we still have to think about uh, the end in mind, which is something that comes from, from Stephen Covey, uh, to, to think, okay, we, we, what, what is it where we want to end up? Um, but at the same time, uh, we want to to think about stop starting and start stopping. We don't want to to do everything until the end. We uh, well, we do want to do everything till the end, but we want to um, we we don't want to start many many new things. So we also want to think about the minimum viable product, which means a, a first set that we want to bring out. Even if we thought about other things, and if you do user story mapping, you think about the broad aspect, but you still want to focus on 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 the first thing to to get out. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, there's a lot of conflicts in, in the Agile mindset. You, you still have to think uh, about, uh, about Yagni, which means uh, you, you ain't going to need it. And I have an interesting story about that because uh, a few years back, I moved with my family from, from Belgium to Bordeaux to, to work there as an Agile coach. Mm -hmm. And we took everything for our five uh, people family in one truck and the, the largest thing I could drive with my normal driving license. And I was really proud because we limited what we took with us. Um, and then I saw a picture from, from a friend of, uh, of for two friends of ours who basically, okay, they didn't have kids, but the, they had everything to work uh, over the, the full globe at, at four different four or five different locations for a year. They, they had in, in four or five bags. So they, they needed a lot less than, than we did. Right. I, I could use the excuse of, okay, we had kids and blah, blah, blah. But the truth is we took a lot of things with us to France that we never used. Mm -hmm. We even took a full television with us that we in the end <laughs> couldn't use. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, there's a lot of things that, and did we forget some things? Yes, but I'm not sure if we forgot less uh, or, or than, than the, these, these two friends of mine who also forgot a few things, but they, they also didn't have to take that much. So they, and because they went out uh, on, on planes everywhere around the world, for them, it would have been way more expensive to take more with them. Right. Um, but. It, it, it keeps reminding me of that because we every time I think, yes, this is the bare minimum, there is somebody who shows me, well, you can actually do it with less. And and that is something to, to remind as a team because every time we think, yeah, we can't do it smaller, there is someone who proves that you can actually do it with less. Yeah. While, um, you were telling, while you were telling this story here, Eve, it's like, uh, it really uh, came back to mind, like the whole uh, tiny house movement here. Um, sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's advocated. It's a very interesting part where you really move into very small, small houses as families, where you go through a very similar exercise about selecting what is essential, what's important for you. And it's um, obviously a family decision. Some, some would like the TV, some, some take it out. Yes, I, it, it, it's interesting because in, in, in Bordeaux, it's, for practical reasons, we couldn't ha have a, 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 a television, which is just basically because we uh, trouble it, it getting a connection. Uh, uh -huh. But in the end, I didn't miss it at all. Uh, my, my oldest son read a lot of books over there. And when he came back, uh, basically television, they expected it again, and they they watch a lot more television than they did before. So I'm not sure how the experiment worked out. <laughs> um, but I, I do know that for, I'm, I'm, pre, I, I'm convinced that it helped him reading much more. Uh, and I'm sad that my other two kids who both lessened into reading uh, don't have that same experience. Of course, it's, it's, it's not just purely on this experiment. I know that he was already uh, a, a good reader before, uh, and, and they, they just have trouble reading at, at, at other levels. But still, I, I think they would have read more if there would not have been uh, a device that, that they can turn on uh, all the time. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I think... I've, I've lived four years of welfare, meaning I had 375 euros uh, a month to, to survive on. That's mm -hmm. basically not enough uh, or, or not much. Um, and I've learned that there's actually not much that I need to, to, to be happy. I, I spent the first year doing IT. So when I was going to college, I, I learned about IT without having a computer. I'm not saying it was easy, it was hard, but it was possible. Yeah. So I've learned that you can actually do it with with a lot less, and um, that is something. And what I see also in if coming back to work is that companies that have most money are not always the ones who have it easier. Sometimes it's smaller companies who don't have enough money who are really really good at making priorities. They don't have a choice, and. Because of that, they get further, and I see other companies that, what I would say, have way too much money. They cannot make priorities, and because of that, they're struggling, because they think they can do everything. But that's just bullshit. Even Amazon or Google or Facebook, they still have more ideas than money. So even if they have a lot of money, they still have more things, so they, they need to prioritize and say, okay, 
what are we going to work on and what is critical to, to do these things. And that is for me also part of the Agile mindset, uh, to, to make priorities and to learn to say no. Because um, I, I had a large discussion today with, with someone who just, yeah, had a hard time saying no. I, I actually asked that person to repeat to me multiple times no, and it was almost impossible. Uh, but for me, if you can't say no, you, your yes just means nothing. Uh, and, and, that, fun, yeah. and that person in, in, in the role that he did, he's doing had a hard time doing that. And because of that, making promises for the full company that people don't trust anymore. Mm -hmm. And, but it's yeah, it's, it's an awesome uh, it's an awesome example here. Even I, I we said earlier on this uh, podcast, this recording, that we would come back to pair coaching. I, I do want to use this opportunity here towards the end to come back, and I want to give you an opportunity to a um, uh, little shout out because PairCoaching.net is quite neglected, purposely neglected at this point, right? Yes. Uh, so a, a few years back, I, I used that to to start some kind of public training company or training company that would focus on having workshops done in pairs and and I the the brand was invented for that but that was in 2007 and more and more I realized that the brand for me is much more about pair coaching and not just about these workshops and so uh, a few years back I said I, I see so many people liking the ID and and I want to say on on, uh, on this as well Although I make a lot of publicity, I, after that I, I found out that I actually wasn't the first who invented, or actually I thought my father invented the, the name when we worked together, but it turns out that J Joshua Karyovsky is the one who's using used it even way before us. Um, but I make a lot of publicity. I, 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 I gave away a lot of t-shirts and, and coffee mugs for, for promoting paircoaching.net. Um, so when I realized that and that the work, and, and I don't like to, to create a workshop company or the training company, so I, I stopped using it for that purpose. But I said it, it's really stupid to have a, a URL that is known to a lot of people, that a lot of people like the ID, and at the same time, uh, a lot of people are looking for in information for pair coaching. So I, I gave away the, uh, the URL to the community in the sense that whoever wants to help out in creating this, I, will, I want to support it and, and give away the URL. A lot of people loved it, but nobody had time, just like I, I have to admit yeah. as well. <laughs> uh, uh, and so right now we had someone who was interested in helping out, but my idea and, and was to, to create a real uh, a wiki Community. so that yeah. a lot of people could, could adapt and, and change it so that it's a lot more self-organizing. And the person who, who wanted to help out uh, just doesn't know enough about wikis and he tried out and, and basically he came back to me uh, about a week or two weeks ago and said, well, I, I just can't figure it out. So if you can find someone who can help me or who want right. to take over to do it, because there is a few open wikis that we can use, uh, but they all, or at least from what I understand, they all force us to have um, to have people logging in before they can do something. And mm -hmm. I, I really want to, to open it up a lot more and, and see how we can do that. Um, but so uh, this is a request to people who are ever hearing this podcast, if they want to help out to, to do this, uh, I would lovely. So they, they can contact me just at... Uh, First name at last name dot be and then um, and we can figure it out how, how to to make it because I really would hope that the URL could go live again mm -hmm. um, and use that the community yes yeah, so yeah. there's a lot of there is there are some podcasts video casts with me on pair coaching there's actually a lot more people doing it than just me uh, who who have. I don't know more or about the same number of experience than me, uh, and I would love to group all that information because it's it's really about having people working together. And I just gave a few examples, but I'm pretty sure that if you talk to ten more people who are doing pair coaching, that they have even better ideas than than I just right. uh, gave now. Awesome, and, and we're gonna put um, also for for everybody interested in connecting. This you can also go on agile.fm, go to this episode here with uh, Eve Anul, and um, just click on that link, and you get to his email. If you are interested in making a big difference here with peercoaching.net, um, well, 
If, um, I do want to say I enjoyed really this conversation immensely here, and I'm sure if you enjoyed it as well, this would not be the last time you appear on on Agile FM. And there's definitely a, a sequel to this to, uh, to this kind of topic. There's a lot of things we could talk about. Um, I do just want to say at the end of uh, our podcast, we have recorded for a while. How many miles did you walk? A mile? Uh, I, I didn't actually look. Wait, let me look at my uh, Um it's almost two kilometers since I turned it on, and that's probably that's about fifteen minutes ago. So, okay, awesome. uh, so a good mile. It, yes. So uh, for everybody, and, yeah, for everybody listening right now to this podcast, while you were maybe sitting in a car, listening to this, or at home, you could have also walked a mile and listened to this podcast, like Eve did while he was recording. And um, I do want to say these kind of ideas who come into our new workplaces make a big difference. And many of these help and encourage agility. I'm so happy you uh, brought those to surface. And uh, just want to thank you, Eve, for taking your time. You're welcome. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. And maybe I could say just, just a mile, because uh, when walking, that we typically uh, um, look at the number of steps. So, of course, okay. we, uh, at this time it's, it's past midnight, so it's a little bit different, difficult to see. But it's, uh, it's 19 after midnight in Belgium. And already since midnight, I made 1,500 steps. And probably about the same uh, before. I'm not sure exactly when we when we started, um, but yeah. I, so yesterday I did fifteen thousand seven hundred eighty-eight steps, for example. Oh, so okay. that's that's, and and they advise ten thousand steps a day. So ever since I have my walking desk, I do a lot more than just ten thousand steps a day. Uh, fifteen thousand is actually a bad day for me. Oh boy, awesome. And uh, also points out that you're a metric person, right? <laughs> Eve, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to Agile FM, the radio for the Agile community. I'm your host, Show Krebs. If you're interested in more programming and additional podcasts, please go to www.agile.fm. Talk to you soon.